final presenter of the session, Martin Woodside, earned his PhD in Childhood Studies from Rutgers University, Camden. His current book project examines how discourses of boyhood and frontier mythology shaped each other and broader ideas of American identity in the second half of the 19th century and beyond. Material from this manuscript has been published in various journals, including Boyhood Studies and the Journal of the History of Childhood and Youth. He will be presenting Considering the Frontiers of Childhood. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you to the center for having me here today. So, on September 14, 1883, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran this brief news story under the headline, Missing Boys, Two Youngsters of Reading Infatuated with Buffalo Bill. <laughs> I'm going to read the whole story here, it's brief. William Dickinson, aged 14 years, and William Stevenson, aged 11, are missing since Monday, since which time nothing has been seen or heard of them. They both left home dressed with the intention of seeing Buffalo Bill. They had been in the habit of reading exciting stories, such as Indian tales, etc., and it is supposed that they must have left with Buffalo Bill during Monday night. The mothers of the young lads are greatly worried, and if the boys do not return soon, their minds might become deranged. Detectives have been notified and telegrams were sent to Harrisburg to Buffalo Bill, who is showing there today. No reply has yet been received. In the 1880s, newspapers sto ran stories like these regularly, describing how blood and thunder fiction seduced children to leave good homes and go west, to play dangerous games, occasionally maiming or even killing a playmate unintentionally, or to form roving gangs that wreaked havoc on orderly neighborhoods and even ventured into criminal behavior. Cody, of course, was no stranger to the dime novel, which did much to make his name. Of course, Buffalo Bill was and is not a monolithic figure, as the celebrated performer's outsized persona, we might say, contained multitudes. So while that perso persona was linked to anxious responses about sensational literature and wayward youth, this only tells part of the story, as evidenced by a separate, provocatively titled 1893 news item, Cured of Indian Fever, a father presents his son's outfit to Buffalo Bill. Now I'll just read you a piece of that. Colonel William F. Cody, Buffalo Bill, had a strange visitor in his camp the other night. He was a middle-aged man with a fatherly look who carried with him a strange assortment of lewd wooden daggers, long pieces of rope, and rusty pistols. He also had a valise full of old cartridges, one or two red feathers, and a leather belt. You may have these, he said, as he pushed them over to the colonel. My son has no further use for them. The Wild West has killed all his desire to eat the flesh of the red man and become another terror of the plains. These two articles hint at the complex relationship between Buffalo Bill and 19th century notions of childhood. In the Philadelphia Inquirer article, Buffalo Bill plays the part of seducer, enticing good boys to leave comfortable homes and risk their lives in the unsettled West. In the second article, he plays a different role altogether, alleviating a youngster of his romantic notions of the West and demonstrating the quote-unquote actual life of the place. When it came to the production and promotion of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, Cody and his business partners were well aware of these conflicting impulses and reactions. The show underwent significant changes in the 10 years between the two news stories, and Buffalo Bill and his partners worked hard to maintain the appeal of their prized attraction to audiences young and old. More broadly, though, Buffalo Bill's varied connections to children and children's culture gestures to the fluid relationship between the frontier and childhood in American popular culture writ large, articulating broader negotiations about race, gender, and power in the late 19th century and beyond. In 1889, Theodore Roosevelt described the winning of the West, wherein the successful civilizing of the frontier doubled as a celebration of, the I of idealized Anglo-Saxon masculinity, establishing the parameters for both the young nation's creation myth and a refurbished vision of American manhood. Frederick Jackson Turner would tease out these narratives more vividly four years later in his landmark essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History. Both Roosevelt and Turner offered reckonings of America's past, but more importantly, look to the future 
and their contributions to the sustaining power of frontier mythology have been much discussed. However, I argue this mythology, this mapping of the frontier as a place where the distinctive American character was produced, was as deeply connected to notions of childhood and in particular boyhood as it was to manhood. In the final decades of the 19th century, American ideas about childhood and the frontier interacted vigorously with one another to inform millennial notions of national identity in ways that have been largely overlooked. Oh, I forgot to show you. There's the two, there's the many sides of Buffalo Bill there. That, I was gratified to see this image actually in my hotel. Um, there he is, a sort of friend of the American child, and that's from his autobiography where he's much more of a sort of Indian, Indian killing dime novel hero. Um, and so he's able to play these and other roles. So my argument builds on the striking similarity between the rhetoric of frontier historians like Roosevelt and Turner and the contemporaneous child study movement. Heavily influenced by evolutionary thinkers like Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer, and Monaco talked about this a little bit, Turner imagined the frontier as a place where the European settler confronted the primitive world with this collision between the savage and civilized yielding the distinctive American character. And there's a quote uh, from his essay talking about this. The relationship between savage and civilized was equally critical to late 19th century theorists of childhood. Psychologist G. Stanley Hall, whose adolescence published in 1904, both named and defined a life stage we now all take for granted, was one of the movement's leaders in America. And sort of much as uh, Turner's describing the frontier here, um, you know, Hall's also describing then um, the way the adolescent is created by savage and civilized coming together, right? to create the distinctive American and then the distinctive um, adolescent. In fact, the story men like Turner wanted to tell about the frontier was markedly similar to the story men like Hall wanted to tell about childhood and adolescence, especially as it pertained to boys. The story drew on distinctive ideologies of race and gender to imagine the West as a literal and metaphorical space for development. For Turner, Spreading American civil the spread of American civilization happened through occupation of the savage frontier. For Hall, developing a generation of powerful American men meant allowing Anglo-Saxon boys to make the most of the savage world and their savage selves. So, you know, he believed in the theory of recapitulation, which they, I'm not going to go into completely now, but they actually had access to sa the savage within, um, which they could use to develop into a, a, a better self. The dynamic figure of Buffalo Bill provides an excellent frame for examining the multifaceted relationship between frontier mythos and American childhood. As Buffalo Bill, Cody presented the, as the archetypal frontier hero, a hero who had a considerable influence on American children. As a performer in dime novels on the stage or most notably in the Wild West arena, he provided a unique model of how frontier rhetoric interacted with late 19th century constructions of childhood. Buffalo Bill's Wild West offers a vivid example of how adults imagine the relationship between childhood and the frontier, and also how the resulting cultural narratives were then received and responded to by large numbers of actual children. And I'm thinking about this story of the Whitney boy this morning, um, which is not uh, atypical. A lot of memoirs would have this sort of um, wistful description of, of the experience in the show and, and how that stayed with them. With its long tenure extending into the first decade of the 20th century, Buffalo Bill's Wild West told no single story. Still, the show's prevailing central theme was the settling and civilizing of the West. And Cody and company tapped into a collective fervor, collective fervor for the past and a shared dream of white American conquest and prosperity. On one hand, the show promised fantasy and escape as staged reenactments of frontier life interacted with children's play. After all, what, what else was Buffalo Bill modeling but Cowboys and Indians, a play script he certainly uh, informed, if not created. At the same time, the show marketed itself as more than mere performance. Cody Bill Buffalo Bill's Wild West as living history, an opportunity to see the frontier, quote unquote, as it was, precisely at the moment when, as Turner suggests, Western migration had reached its terminus and there was no frontier left to see. The show and the iconic figure of Cody himself was built on the idea that frontier life developed American boys into the right kind of American men. At the same time, it suggested that this frontier life had become unattainable, that the best and in some case only way to experience it 
was through reenactment. In this way, Buffalo Bill's Wild West offered a conflation of human development and theatrical performance. In Cody's West, the theme of continual rebirth is persistently vividly preserved and inscribed through the performance of history. This history casts the West as a mythic space forever young, a space where the virgin land births and nurtures robust specimens of American boyhood, a space that forms these specimens, much like Cody himself, into powerful visions of American masculinity. And I think actually this image shows that, some of that, but back to the settler's cabin. Um, this was in many of the programs, and it's often reproduced, but I like the inset there. So after Buffalo Bill helps save uh, the family from the Indian incursion, there's a sort of passing the torch scene with the young boy there in the inset image, right? Who, yeah, of course he's holding the gun. What else would he do? For the generations of children who couldn't experience the frontier as Cody had, Buffalo Bill's Wild West served as a vital conduit. Reinforcing the bond between childhood and the frontier, it played a crucial role in defining American identity in the late 19th century. Encountering the show, American children could be both entertained and educated. At the same time, some of the show's young performers and audience members found unintended flexibility in the show's dominant narrative. And I'll touch on those a little bit toward the end here. Through performance, these child performers simultaneously reproduced visions of dominant masculinity in American imperialism and also revealed space for creating alternative or counter narratives. In some cases, young performers disrupted the show's constructive discourses of race and gender to exert a kind of agency they've not been given much credit for. So Cody's appeal to children was strongly connected to his own mythic status as a child of the plains, a heroic figure shaped by his own frontier upbringing. In Beetle and Adam's 1881 Adventures of Buffalo Bill from Boyhood to Manhood, Prentice Ingraham describes the young Cody's thirst for youthful adventure. He writes that Cody's father, quote unquote, allowed his son to go armed, and in fact, Billy always hung up his pistol with his hat, a pistol he prized above his books and pony, and always kept in perfect order. In fact, in the novel, Billy's gun proves far more useful than his school books. In one instance, when outlaws come to steal his father's horses, Cody shoots one dead, holding the three others at bay until help arrives. Much of this fictionalized book mimics Cody's own autobiography, which emphasizes similar themes if in a more restrained tone. But in both books, the rugged and dangerous West helps Cody develop from typical boy into robust American hero. This story, of course, had, you know, contained a potential paradox how Buffalo Bill celebrated how the frontier could turn boys into successful men. At the same time, as we saw from that earlier article, this rhetoric ran the risk of supporting the notion that Buffalo Bill's Wild West would entice impressionable youth to run away and head west. To some degree, this paradox was unresolvable, and Cody and his partners didn't fully attempt to resolve it. Inside the arena, they extolled these youthful adventures, imagining a frontier where boys are shaped into sturdy men and the nation is continuously revitalized as a space of development and progress. But as we also heard earlier, they also stressed education. And outside of the arena, Cody and his partners stressed that educational value of the show, addressing child spectators and their adult caretakers alike. In 1898, Bison Courier, and I'm pretty sure I found th this here, um, uh, cut in the shape of a large bison's head, provides one example of these efforts. Inside it bears the heading, For the Children's Eyes informing the reader, and this is a quote, your parents will combine duty with pleasure by taking you to see it, and that's the show they're talking about. Educated by this experience, it reads, sensible boys will not be misled by demoralizing blood and thunder stories, though they will remain stalwart citizens ready to defend the nation as uh, need arises. That's, that's my synopsis of the book. Young readers are encouraged to conflate westward expansion with the recent Spanish-American War, and by 1898, Cody and company had successfully woven the Indian Wars into a long story of America's sacred cause, which is what it calls it in the book, beginning with the revolution and seemingly to be continued the expansion of American imperialism. In the Bison Courier, the story of the West is the story of America, a narrative aimed both at children and their parents. And it reads, what the children see at Buffalo Bill's Wild West, they will enjoy, appreciate, understand, and remember. What parents see there, they will wish their children taught. So Buffalo Bill's Wild West demonstrates not only how frontier narratives were adapted for children as entertainment and pseudo history, but also how children themselves interacted with these narratives. Child performers were actually a little known hallmark of the show, informing and accentuating the relationship between child and the frontier, both in the arena 
and the nation itself during the second half of the 19th century. And I'm going to look at a few of them, again, focusing mostly on Boyd, as I've already heard about Annie Oakley and William Smith. Johnny Baker served the longest tenure of any child performer in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. In 1876, at seven years old, he saw Buffalo Bill on stage. He idolized Cody and ended up more or less being adopted by the famous scout and traveling with Buffalo Bill's Wild West up until its final performance. He performed as a marksman at 14, but on into adulthood, Wild West promotional literature stressed his youthful vigor. So in an 1895 program, show publicist John Burke describes Baker, then 26, as a typical boy of the type only produced in America. Baker, Burke notes, is in full possession of that elasticity and conscious strength and self-reliance which marks the young frontiersman. As we've seen, in the laboratory of the frontier, boys such as Baker become men like Cody, growing up with the country and the nation itself, possessing that self-reliance to succeed in the harshest of environments and the conscious strength to master the task at hand, Baker can perform feats of marksmanship most adults couldn't, suggesting the continued domination of the white frontier hero in the space of the Wild West. The rhetoric of romantic or natural childhood becomes more pronounced in descriptions of the show's uh, uh, Native American child performers. Describing these children, Burke turns to Wordsworth himself, the standard bearer of romantic childhood. Burke writes, that the boy is father of the man is not more truly exemplified than in the case of the Indian boy. Lithe and active and fearless as young panthers, these boys display a vim and go which no artificial system could inculcate. In Burke's purple prose, the young Indian boy, like Johnny Baker, represents a type of masculinity produced by the hardships of frontier living. Unlike Baker, the Indian boy lacks restraint, his reactions guided by pure animal impulse rather than Anglo-Saxon self-mastery. And that goes back to this, you know, Baker is the perfect collision of savage and civilized, whereas the young Indian performers can only manage the savage part of the equation. Buffalo Bill's Wild West drew on ideas of Indian child savagery in myriad ways, at times extending beyond typical discourses of boyhood. In the arena, young Indian boys were not only fearless, they could be both hostile and aggressive, taking part in simulated attacks on the Deadwood stage in the settler's cabin. Outside the arena, these young performers were key players in the show's reproduction of frontier domesticity. And I'm not gonna have time for this now, but uh, one thing I'm really interested in is the Indian, or the, the camp around the show and how it formed as a site of performance on a daily basis where, um, you know, these, these uh, performers in the show were interacting with, with people who are not in the show, and children play a big role in this. Everywhere Buffalo Bill's Wild West played, a real life frontier village was erected where cowboys, Indians, and Cossacks alike all pitched their tents and settled in. In this way, performance in Buffalo Bill's Wild West was not confined to the arena. It commences soon as the members of the show disembark from the train at Shannon. And here's Johnny Baker next to another child performer. Uh, publicity materials proudly touted seven-year-old Johnny Burke Nonak as the sole survivor of the Wounded Knee Massacre, and Johnny accompanied Buffalo Bill to England in 1891-92. He was adopted by John Burke and, um, and Nonak. The performances of Johnny and these other young show Indians um, raise some disturbing, intriguing questions about performance and agency. Were these children simply reproducing Wild West scripts they saw enacted all around them? Were they performing some kind of hybridity, mixing these frontier narratives with their own uh, play scripts? Johnny Burke, no neck, offers an extreme example, um, but for the Wild West Indian child performers, negotiating these questions of agency and identity could be especially tricky. Many of them had grown up on Indian reservations or with the show itself. It's impossible to know for certain how they understood their role as performers. And the few roles they left behind, for instance, accounts by Luther Standing Bear, disrupt the notion of cultural archiving as purely a top-down process. And again, I can, I can go into that more later if you want to know about that. If Buffalo Bill's Wild West presented a cohesive and persistent nature of white male pioneers triumphing over Indian savages, the interactions of child performers in and around the show suggest something more fractured, less monolithic, uh, a set of interpretations that's a little more nuanced. In practice, they more closely resemble what Robin Bernstein calls a repertoire, which as she writes, is by nef definition in constant flux, always being remade. These reformations occur with the exercise of agency as well as accidentally on a small scale through authored and unauthored elements. So uh, Buffalo Bill's narrative of white male American progress was unauthored by its very nature, filtered through the broad or multi-authored 
filter through the broad dimensions of his life story, which existed at countless literary productions, Wild West shows, toys, promotional materials, newspaper accounts, and so on. Imagine through these diffuse cultural mechanisms, Buffalo Bill's Wild West presented opportunities for various social actors to refract and reform the central themes of this narrative without producing any single unified story. Many of these opportunities came outside the arena, and unfortunately, many of them failed to appear in records of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. So, uh, you know, records of, um, of, of older men recalling times when they were boys playing uh, outside the arena with, with performers. Um, uh, there are a few of those, but uh, there must have been a lot more of that. Uh, remaining accounts do suggest child performers and spectators of the show had ample opportunity to structure their own meaningfulness dominant narratives. Children, of course, are not passive recipients of these kinds of narratives. Rather, they respond to them as meaning makers, most notably through the act of play. Whether it be city children playing with young show Indians outside of Buffalo Bill's Wild West in the 1890s, or suburban kids playing cowboys and Indians decades later, this kind of play demonstrates children exhibiting agency, giving shape to American and frontal mythos from the ground up. And that's, that's basically it. There's just a couple more examples of, of other ways where we can see this reverberations of, an, of Buffalo Bill and the culture of childhood through scouting and, of course, uh, toy, toy gun play. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, Monica, and Martin for three really interesting papers that can take us in a lot of directions. I'm just going to go ahead and open it up for questions, comments, and discussion if you want to come up to the front so we can see your faces. Questions? Yes. Do we have microphones coming? Is that a thing happening? We have a question. So, uh, I appreciate what you brought up. It's got all sorts of thoughts going through my head, and also thoughts that somewhat go back to what Patty Limerick was talking about of paradox. Um, I've always kind of looked at, for example, Annie Oakley, and I think we can see that with Lillian Smith even more in some ways, as being sort of the beginning of a new woman, not so much the new girl, or even uh, Johnny Baker somewhat being the new boy. Uh, you know, you see the creation of that in the United States with the Girl Scouts, as you pointed out, which is really interesting, Boy Scouts, which you point out. But I'm thinking about Annie Oakley, and I'm thinking she is paradoxical. She opposed women's suffrage. She dressed very demurely, very Victorian. And then um, she did some decidedly un-Victorian and very progressive things, shooting as well as men, confronting them on the field of sort of um, uh, contest shooting better than them, and then going out uh, bicycling, as you pointed out, and then also jumping over tables. Have you seen those pictures of her jumping over tables? It's decidedly more vigorous and certainly nothing you can do in a tight corset. And uh, so I see that. But then 1904, I think you showed the picture of the woman playing croquet, which is still very Victorian in my mind, or the girl playing croquet. But by 1910, we're seeing women riding bucking broncos and wild, bo they're riding bulls. And uh, even Goldie Griffiths is demonstrating fisticuffs. So it seems to me there's something that's happening there that moves very quickly beyond the realm of the Victorian. And that Annie and some of the other people of the Wild West help usher that in. Uh, you've seen the picture, the bevy of Wild West girls, perhaps the poster. And the women are doing remarkable things on the back of horses. So I'm not sure how I react to that in regards, particularly, Monica, to what you said with the new girl and some of this reinforcement. Amy, maybe in England, it's moving them forward, but also sort of reinforcing some older, more Victorian-seeming values. It seems to me women are breaking the bonds in many ways, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West helps them do that. Perhaps Annie in a paradoxical style does too. So I don't know where I'm going with this, but I just wanted to see if we got some reaction on this because I really see at the museum uh, women coming and they're resonating to seeing these stories about Annie and the other women. And they're saying, yeah, this is why Buffalo Bill still matters. So anyway, there's almost a sermon, sorry. Um, I was wondering if you, if you were aware that Annie Oakley learned to ride a bike in Glasgow, Scotland. 
are you are you aware that Annie Oakley um, learned to ride her bike in Glasgow, Scotland? Yeah, because I, I may have missed some of what you said because I'm a bit deaf, but I just wanted to point that out. Also, another a, a performer there who went to Glasgow was Johnny Burke Nonek. I'd like to state that having seen various sources from the newspapers, various press statements about his wounded knee provenance, I don't believe it. If I, I would like to specifically allege he was the natural son of, of Chief Nonek. I know that I saw Patty Limerick's hand up. Uh, oh, this is sort of a public communication moment because I'm going to ask if you guys have worked with K through 12 teachers on this, the things you've been presenting, because it seems like that would be a spectacular audience for if, if K through 12 teachers had the case studies that you've presented to use. But I wanted to ask, because you never quite know what's happening to audiences, uh, would there be a danger that your studies, and I'm thinking of all of you, would actually add anxious self-consciousness to a group of young people in a historical era where anxiety is a nervousness about identity, concerns about figuring out where they fit in the world and so on. Would it actually be a bad idea for you to talk to K through 12 teachers? Because you might introduce studies and case stories that might make them even weirder than they are and in a nervous <laughs> age, because it is, it is a tough time, I mean, it's not getting any easier for anybody to navigate these ages. So, that's the question. I haven't actually worked with, um, with K through 12 teachers on anything about this, but um, I am, I have a, a couple of contacts in Girl Scouts of America in my local community, and we've talked a little bit about trying to develop um, some programs for Girl Scouts about this, and um, we haven't exactly figured out where we're going to go with this. But um, the, for me, um, in some ways, because uh, scouting, Girl Scouts have a, a very distinctive institutional culture, which I think enables, um, it, it might, might help sort of, um, enable young, young women to um, think through and talk over those possible contradictions in a way that um, maybe in a, in a K through 12 setting would be more difficult. And I also kind of feel like, I don't know about your states, but I'm, I'm from Wisconsin and um, school teachers are feeling a little bit thrown back on the defensive. So, and there's a lot of pressure on them to uh, sort of cover content, but there isn't really a, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of space in there for any kind of history at all. So um, I do know some K through 12 teachers and we've kind of battered a few ideas around, but I think probably the, the most immediate opportunity that I have for bringing this to, um, to, to new other audiences, I, and I would love to see what, what some Girl Scouts make of this, I would. I have two questions, one for, oh. I have not spoken directly to K through 12 educators about Lillian, but I have talked to some of my students, my undergraduate students who are just about to go on to get their teaching credential. So I asked them, hey, you know, what, what if anything do you see about her story that is um, translatable to curriculum for students that young? And um, even in a relatively, well, very, I'm from Los Angeles, so it's it's fair about as liberal as you can get. Um, th the The problem is we're still not quite there in terms of being able to discuss the co-opting of Native American identities at the turn of the last century. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing, the positive, um, what I was able to do was speak to the occasional undergraduate class, history class, about historiographies. And, and just letting them know that just because um, what you see is a, is a printed word or statement about somebody in history, if something strikes you as interesting, dive deep because just because it's in print doesn't mean it's true. I mean, things get passed along. I mean, these things about Lillian that have been um, attached to Annie Oakley and so many others in um, Buffalo Bill's Wild West for so long have made them true. 
Um, and they're not. She wasn't Native American. She wasn't a lot of things. So um, that's that's just one one thing. I have two questions. One for Martin. Did you ever find a follow up on whether the two boys resurfaced? <laughs> And have you read? And have you heard of any other cases of that? I mean, we used to, we've always heard about that in recent years about running away to join the circus. Did Buffalo Bill set the pattern on that? <laughs> I mean, you know, this this the newspapers were uh, fiction, you know, playing this up, but it really did happen, right? Um, you know, people did want to run away to the West. Um, and there was fanciful stories like when Buffalo Bill went to England, they described a special staff of detectives at the docks in Liverpool to prevent children from getting on the boat. Um, but even Gordon Lilly, right, even he ran away from home kind of, they, they, you know. So, you know, this did happen. And even uh, Doc Harper, I think, in his promotional materials would talk about how he ran away to go west. It wasn't even um, running away always in those stories. It was just kind of making your way, but as a very young boy. Um, so, I mean, it did happen. Um, and it became increasingly a concern as middle class childhood became sort of entrenched in, in American culture. And all of a sudden it was seen as running away. It's like, this is a dangerous thing. You're, you know, and um, you're, gonna, you're gonna be lured into a false life. Alcott writes about this um, in Eight Cousins, actually, the lure of, of sensational literature, convincing middle class children to, to, or boys in particular to like think outside of a middle class family and go in, uh, down a disastrous path. So it's part of that. Um, reaction and it, it really it did happen and it was a big fear a larger fear than I think it actually happened yeah I I think this is a, a really interesting moment about when there's actually a kind of a, a cultural discussion going on over how much supervision should children have um, you and you can kind of see this in um, for example um, Tom Sawyer and um, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, kind of this exploration of what are boys going to do when you like leave them alone and don't pay any attention to what they get up to. Is that good? Is it bad? Are they going to develop character and manliness? Are they going to become junior criminals and consort with black people? Or what is, what is going to go on? So I think that's happening and I think there's also an older, you know, possibly even going back to, you know, the medieval period, kind of this suspicion of theater and show people generally that they are outside the boundaries of community, normalcy, family, um, and uh, all those institutions. They come, they go, they're heterogeneous spaces. And so I think there's also that element going on here in these narratives of boys running off to join the Wild West. My name is Montale Dakin. Uh, and Monica, this is for you. When you put Annie Oakley's picture next to the Girl Scouts picture, bingo, that was something that just hit me. And if you don't mind, I'd like to give your name to the woman who heads up the Wichita Girl Scouts. And I think she would be very interested in what you um, are showing and what you're starting to talk about. Thank you. That, I, please do, I can give you my card after this. Um, this, and this actually reminds me of something I wanted to loop back to something Patty said. I think one interesting place that could be explored here is um, our guns. Guns are a place, uh, Cody and Annie Oakley are a good chance to talk about guns and guns are a place where academic historians and um, other, and, and not just at, where, where historians generally and other people who are not historians can kind of come together and talk about wh what do guns mean in America? Like guns are very powerful in multiple ways and whether you fear them or love them or are suspicious of them, I think talking about, I th and I think guns for, for women is, are also really, it's sort of fraught. So I think, um, you know, talking about what, what does gun ownership mean? What does shooting mean as a sport? Um, how should young women um, feel about guns? Having that conversation is, is really important, and I think Annie Oakley, and, and to a lesser extent, just the Wild West in general, could be a, f a really neat way of exploring that. Uh, I just wanted to say that my grandfather was one of those boys that did run away from home, uh, from a small coal mining town, Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania, 
to Philadelphia. He was 12 years old and he got on a freight train with uh, two friends. They were 12 and 13. Uh, went to Philadelphia, went to the Wild West to, to see Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill had pulled up the side of the tent so that th these little boys could see the show. They just had thought that they might be able to catch sight of this famous man. And so from the time I was a little girl, he told us the story of seeing Buffalo Bill at this show. The other thing he talked about throughout his life was uh, a few years later being in uh, service in World War I. So he was a little boy that was so uh, influenced by the personality of William F. Cody and in a very good way. And the reason I'm here and passionate about this museum is because of the story that Wilbur Morse told his granddaughter. We have someone who's been waiting very patiently. One row in front of Dr. Warren. I apologize. <laughs> I don't know. Hi, my name is Joe Johnson. First of all, kudos to a guy taking early childhood. Not many men are in early childhood. And I really thank you for it, child development. Simpsons over here know me, and they know Fred Garlow, and they knew Fred's brother, Bill Garlow, Cody. They both went to my kids' schools and presented exactly what you guys are saying. And California, I'm from California. It's very much Girl Scout in California. Girls are very much involved in sports. And the kids from uh, London rode the horses in the rodeo in 2008. Those kids were all in, involved in, I think, cricket and horseback riding. And you know, just keep it going. Just keep it going from generation to generation. It's there, just keep it going. I think having kids involved in sports, involved in history, builds our character. Thank you. I wasn't gonna do that. Okay, for those of you, how many of you are from Cody? Okay, so you know Fred and Bill Garlow. Okay, my mother was Jane Cody Garlow. Okay, by the way, she also rode horses there in her 60s, so. Keep up the work you guys are doing in the schools because that's exactly what we need is those kids guided into that type of thing. Thank you for sharing that with us. There's a hand over here and then a hand in the back. My name is Bill Bowl, and I wondered if you did any research on the Cody Scouts. They were a group of young boys that followed with the Wild West show, and they had their own uniforms and that. And then when Cody show went bankrupt, they went on with the walk home. But they were a free runner of the uh, um, Boy Scouts. Yeah, I've done. I need to know more about them, but I've, I've, I'm working a little bit now on Cody's. Um, contributions to American scouting because he did he, he tried to form a military college a Cody military college here of course that's one thing um, and he did have the, the Cody Scouts um, and, bo and early Boy Scout literature mentions him prominently um, that image I showed you know we somebody mentioned how many Wild West shows there were well there were a, a whole lot of Boy Scout organizations in the first decade of the 20th century too that was actually a picture from William, William Randolph Hearst's more militaristic one which failed uh, before the Boy Scouts of America sort of became the one. Um, so he did have a lot to do with, with American scouting. And after Ernest Seton and, and Daniel Beard were sort of forced out of the Boy Scouts of America, he, I think that was covered up. But I think he was very influential directly and indirectly in, in the Boy Scouts of America and all the scouting that happened in the first um, part of the 20th century. I'd love to see it. Yeah. 
Oh, please do. Thanks, uh, Bob Rydell here. Just an uh, observation going back to what Patty was saying about educating kids. Um, no knock on Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, but um, the single best history presentation I've heard this year um, was actually a group of 4-H kids um, working with um, teachers and talk about performance art, talk about intersection of history, learning about history period costume, and guess what, shooting. Um, it's really an amazing, which is absolutely extraordinary. So for any of you interested in the intersection between history, academic, K-12, and public, 4-H um, uh, is much neglected, and that's a shame. Now a question for you, Annie Oakley question, or um, Lillian Smith question. Um, if I go to the late 19th century, um, I confess, and I haven't looked in intensely or extensively for this, do you see images of young girls, adolescent girls, dressing up as Annie Oakley or Lillian Smith? Thanks. That's a really good question, and I haven't seen anything like that. There's actually a really wonderful article by an Australian historian named Anne McGrath which, um, among other things, examines the um, popularity of um, mass-produced um, Annie Oakley-branded cowgirl costumes um, in the middle of the 20th century. And, um, and these were extremely popular in Australia. She, she did some ethnography and got all these women reminiscing about their Annie Oakley um, cowgirl costumes. I think. I think that question um, is a really good one, and I think the answer to it would need to be contextualized in a kind of larger understanding of masquerade and dressing up in childhood culture, and also how those things might relate to consumer culture. Um, because unless you're gonna have your, your mother like make you a costume, and some moms would, <laughs> but um, how, to what lengths are parents willing to facilitate dress up play? Um, is dress up play seen as a positive or is it like a waste of time? Um, you know, I think there are a lot of questions there actually. We have time for just one more quick comment. I'm gonna hand it to Louis Warren and then after that, please join me in thanking all of our presenters. Yeah, in terms of a the photograph question, there is a, a Solomon Butcher photograph of a Nebraska homesteader young woman. I can't tell how old she is. She seems to be late teens, early 20s, dressed up very much in the clothing that Annie Oakley, the style of clothing Annie Oakley would wear with a gun, right? Uh, and it's about it's late 1880s or later. And it's not clear to me from the photograph that Annie Oakley is her model. It might be that Annie Oakley is using some style of cowgirl dress that comes out of dime novels. I'm not really sure. But there seemed to be something very powerful going on there where this Nebraska homesteader girl is dressed up as a frontier heroine, right? And there's a whole, there's some kind of drama going on there. It's black, and I can't tell what it is. It looks like it could be black leather, or it's probably a black fabric that she's b bought from, you know, the dry goods store. I mean, these are Solomon Butcher's people right, in, in Nebraska. Um, but the other thing, the great presentations, I really like them. And just the one thing I would say that links them all together and validates everything you're talking about is, in, at least in my reading of the development of the Wild West show, Cody himself was, was intimately aware of all of these problems of presenting his show to the public. That, that first year, Martin, the, the quote about the two boys running away from home in 1883, the newspapers were full of that stuff in 1883, and the reviews were, as the first year of the show, it's a, it's, a, it's a show that is in a sense entertaining, say the reviewers, but it is a bunch of rough looking guys with a lot of guns, right? And he, Cody is, has got to turn this thing into a family entertainment. And the way you do that is you, you hire Annie Oakley, right? And you hire Lillian Smith. Uh, you hire some women who are really better with guns than just about any man in the arena and then you start to say, you know, middle class women will start to say, hey, I, I think I could take my family to this show. And then you're in the money, right? If you're Cody, then you're really in the money. And just, it, it validates, I think, everything you're talking about here, all the tensions and all those developments. Um, and when I thought, really great job. Terrific, thank you.